So what exactly is rhino? Rhino, otherwise known as uh, rhinoceros or rhino 3D, but commonly it's just known as rhino, is an open freeform 3D modeling software. Um, it was developed by Robert McNeil and Associates, which uh, interestingly enough are ex-AutoCAD developers. So uh, the transition between AutoCAD and Rhino is made easier in that the commands are 99% the same. Its first release was back in 1998, and it's used extensively in the jewelry and furniture design industries, as well as architecture, obviously, all the way through to marine and automotive industries. So it's really known as the Swiss army knife of 3D modeling. In architecture, it's used, everything, it's used for everything from schematic design um, to quickly assess design options all the way through to the uh, process of creating construction documents um, and uh, full construction details and annotations and producing basically drawings that uh, you would create out of AutoCAD. It just varies firm to firm what their workflow looks like. The native auto, uh, sorry, the native Rhino file format is .3DM. And the re another reason why it really is the Swiss Army knife of 3D modeling software is it exports into 49 different file formats, an extraordinary amount. So to download and install Rhino um, following this uh, demonstration or this presentation, there's a demonstration on how to download and install Rhino. However, if you just go to rhino.com or rhino3d.com um, and then click on the download link, you can download the evaluation trial, which lasts for 90 days uh, for free. And that will cover everything you're going to need to do for my assignment. So the biggest key concept to get our heads around is the fact that Rhino is a NURBS-based modeling software, um, as well as mesh. It does do mesh, but it is uh, based upon its real power is NURBS-based modeling. So let's understand the key uh, criteria between the two. So with mesh modeling, um, basically meshes are essentially a list of points and uh, meshes are made up of vertices, edges, and faces. So to give an example on this head here, these intersections where these different lines or vertices meet, they are points. The vertices are the lines that connect the points and then edges are the edges of a surface. And then the faces are obviously the, the bigger surfaces um, on the mesh. Uh, they're, they're infinitely faceted. So no matter how close you zoom into a mesh model, it will always be a flat surface that's creating um, even the curvature, uh, what appears to be a curved surface. So in order to increase the resolution, you have to do what's called subdivision. So for instance, this is a good, a good diagram where we start with a, a model that looks like this for a head and we continue to subdivide the mesh until we get to the, the advanced stage of modeling or the advanced stage of the mesh. So this is highly subdivided. It is hard to manipulate or harder to manipulate um, standard mesh. Uh, it requires a lot of skill to get to that point and is quite hard to go back a step if, um, if you need to later on. So common softwares that are mesh based are SketchUp, um, AutoCAD, Revit, most BIM softwares are mesh-based softwares. Uh, other softwares like ZBrush, and that's commonly used, you know, if we think of um, animation studios like Pixar and DreamWorks, um, Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., all of these are mesh-based softwares, um, but they're highly, highly subdivided using extremely powerful computers to then animate them. Looking at um, a NURBS base um, system. So NURB stands for non-uniform rational baseline and it runs off of a UV coordinate system. So X, Y, Z coordinates mean that they're always within a plane of space where the U and V is a coordinate that is relative to the surface, no matter the shape of that surface. So what that means is that NURBS has a precise and well-known definition of a point on a surface in space. And um, it, what that also means is the point is always continuous. So, oh, sorry, the curve is always continuous. So no matter how close you zoom in to a NURBS curve, it will never appear faceted. It will always be perfectly curved. And that has to do with the way that it mathematically represents 3D geometry and the formula behind it. 
And what that means then is that the mathematical definition is continuous and is infinite in precision, which is much like the real world. So, um, you know, a curved surface does not, does not, a real curved surface does not actually have flat individual uh, vertices along that curve. It is truly curved. Whether it is a perfect curve or not is uh, indifferent. The definition is continuously curved along the path. If you want to learn more about mesh and uh, sorry NURBS and the actual uh, definition, the mathematical definition behind it, feel free to to click on the link. But it's one that you need to understand the the principle of NURBS, but you definitely don't need to understand the formulas or the equations into how they come about. So for online tutorials and resources, uh, this is a video that we'll be watching in class, the difference between meshes and NURBS. Uh, and that's a very, very good explanation, much more succinct than I can make it on the key differences between the two with some great diagrams and, um, and, and uh, formulas. There are a couple other resources to utilize, um, not so much but just around what NURBS are and what meshes are, but really just how to use Rhino in general for architecture. So the first one is Think Parametric. This is a uh, an online tutorial website for all architectural softwares. It is one you have to pay for, though it is a very low fee for a student. Um, it's one that I personally still have because it will have it has a massive list of different softwares and, and products in there. And uh, even for myself, who's been using Rhino for a good five or six years, I still learn new things every day uh, and still need to reference a resource like this. Rhino 3D, the actual Rhino website has a really good uh, learning component, learning module um, with videos and very good explanations. Um, there is a, a link to a, a YouTube video by, I can't, I cannot remember the tutor's name, but it, this is actually an introduction for Rhino 3D for Architects for second year bachelor students at uh, uh, a university, uh, I think it's university, Delft University in the Netherlands. Um, so it's the full course introduction there. That's quite long. I think it's about an hour or two hours long, but um, that is uh, a really good resource to take a look at as well. How to Rhino is a fantastic YouTube channel. Um, I think that uh, that's definitely one that I would utilize um, on the daily when I'm using Rhino. And obviously because it's on YouTube is a free resource. And the last one is another paid resource, which is Archistar Academy. This is similar to Think Parametric. It has a lot of tutorials, not just on uh, Rhino, but it has certifications in Photoshop, InDesign, Revit, AutoCAD, uh, all sorts of different softwares. Um, and that one is utilized, uh, Archistar actually are the main supplier for tutorials for say University of New South Wales, I think University of Queensland, as well as a couple of big architecture firms have accounts with them. So very commonly, if you are looking at Rhino or any software at uni, they don't necessarily, they do not have workshops like we do where it's a whole semester or a term learning a software. Essentially, you're just pointed in the direction, go visit this website and go watch the tutorials and learn it on your own. So Rhino is the third software in the list of four that we're going through. That being, you know, we have already completed uh, AutoCAD. We've now also completed Photoshop. We're now up to Rhino. And then our final semester, we focus wholly on Autodesk Revit. So let's take a look at the uh, interface of Rhino. When you first start up Rhino, you're greeted with a startup screen. Uh, and it's broken up into a few different uh, a few different tabs and areas. So the new tab really denotes which model type you're using. Uh, long story short, it has to do with the tolerance that's used in the software, depending, you know, if you've got a, a building that's a skyscraper that you're modeling, the tolerance the software needs to use, the mathematical system in the background, it, it obviously has to be different compared to a ring or a piece of jewelry, for instance. But a uh, you know, quick tip, we utilize large objects in millimeters because you know millimeters because we're in architecture. If we're in civil engineering or civil construction, you'd use meters. The next tab opens up recent files. So if you click on that, it will open up, it will show you windows of recently uh, utilized files and you can just pick them up where they left off. You can open new files. And then on the right hand side, there's some news and tips that are linked right to the Rhino website. When you first open up the user interface, now just a quick note that this is my user interface, so it will look slightly different to yours, but I cover how to customize that 
uh, and dock custom windows uh, in the interface tour uh, coming up in this tutorial. So the first component is the viewports. These are your four modeling windows. You can maximize and minimize these. So you can have just one, you can have four of these, you have three, you have um, six of them. You can have as many as you want, but they are known as viewports. Rhino is a, is a commands based software. So there are three different methods to execute commands in Rhino. The first one being these drop down menus. When you click on each of these menus, they're categorized into different geometrical operations. And essentially every command that you can type is also denoted within these drop down menus. The second method is to use the toolbars, which otherwise we could call tabs and ribbons, but Rhino officially calls them toolbars. And these are essentially the same commands, but in a uh, in an icon format, if you prefer to, to use uh, that method. The method that I would recommend you utilize, and it's the one that I utilize 99% of the time, is the command bar. This works exactly like AutoCAD, where at any point you type in the command, um, it will auto complete it or will auto suggest other commands to you in the command line. And then you just follow the prompts to execute the command. We then have all, we have windows um, or what we call windows, Rhino calls panels. So panels are like layers, properties, materials, display options, um, all sorts of different items. We'll go through those in detail, but they are nonetheless, they're known as panels. And then we have toggles. So the toggles at the bottom are really like check. The reason why they're called toggles are they're more on off commands. They're, they're just zero and one commands. Either you've got the item ticked or you haven't got it ticked. So that includes your snaps and it also includes like your ortho mode, smart tracking, which is kind of like your polar tracking inside of uh, AutoCAD uh, and your grid snaps, uh, much like, you know, these are all very similar commands to what's in AutoCAD. So we'll, Take a look now of how uh, we'll take a look in greater detail how to download Rhino and install it, and then we'll open it up and um, begin more of an in depth user interface tour. You can download Rhino from the Rhinoceros website by either going to rhino3d.com or simply by searching Rhino 3D download in Google. When we go to the home page, we just click on the downloads link, the downloads tab, which then brings up the option to download the software for either the Mac operating system or for Windows. In our case for this course, we'll be learning the software via Windows, though the differences between Mac and Windows for Rhino are pretty minimal. What we do then is we simply then click on the Rhino 7 link and when we click on that, it will prompt us to make an account with uh, Rhino or to log in if you've previously got one. And it will then download the install package and all you have to do is follow the prompts. After the 90 days are complete and the 90 days is more than enough for us to complete the assignment in full and to have some time left over for you to play around with, the trial will stop working and it will prompt you to buy a license. Now, if I click on the buy link here, we can see the pricing for commercial uh, for commercial use or for student use. For commercial use, the dollars are, den are den denominated in um, USD, um, and we're looking at around about twelve to thirteen hundred dollars per license for commercial use. However, if you're a student, you can pick up the entire software, the exact same software for Rhino Seven, for around two hundred and sixty two hundred and seventy Australian dollars. You get to keep that version for life. There's no recurring costs um, and you can use that for commercial use. So if you go into practice after studying, you're free to use it. So you're gonna be saving yourself over a thousand dollars if you choose to purchase the software. However, again, for my course, it's not compulsory. There's no need to. And for future um, study use, when, um, when you're going through other subjects, if you don't have access to Rhino, Box Hills uh, Computer Labs have Rhino 7 installed. With Rhino open, let's take a closer look at the interface. I'll cover gen the general orientation and then look at each element in greater detail. So to begin, we have our viewports, our modeling windows known as viewports in the center. We then have our drop down menus across the top, edit, curve, view, etc. We then have our tab and ribbons. So our tabs across here, and then the ribbon that changes icons based upon the tab that we click on. These are sometimes, or these are otherwise known in Rhino as toolbars. 
We then have our windows, so properties, layers, materials, saved views, etc. And then we finally have our toggles at the bottom, so our snaps, uh, planar mode, smart track, um, gumball, filtering, record history, stuff like that. So Rhino is a command driven software and in total there are three different methods to execute a command. And much like CAD, the quickest way is to type in the command into the command bar um, that will prompt the next action of that command. So taking a closer look at the command bar, much like AutoCAD, this is where you can type in a command and it has the ability to auto finish your, your um, suggested command. So if I type in IL, oh sorry, LI for line, you can see that well line is the first option that it's looking at, but then underneath anything that begins with LI is also listed below. If I type in TR for trim, TR um, trim is the first command that comes up, but the smart thing about Rhino is that it learns over time. So when you first open up Rhino out of the box and you type in TR, it's usually the first one triangulate mesh um, that will be the auto finish or the auto guess uh, solution. But the more times that you pick trim, uh, Rhino will eventually learn what your favorite commands are and put those to the top of the list. So much like in AutoCAD, when you type in a command, you hit enter, and then the, the, the bottom line of the command bar will then give us the uh, either options um, within the next section of the command, or it will essentially give us the, the directive for the next step of the command. Meanwhile, up above here, this is like a, this is our history window, which tells us the history of commands and operations that we've been doing. Now, I don't need to type an, a command into the command bar. I could literally be in the middle of a modeling window, just you know, modeling away, and then I might type in um, curve. And you can see it will automatically type it into the command bar, even though I didn't click in the command bar to begin with. The second method of executing commands is through um, the drop down menus. So across the top, we have the first two are very typical of what's in, I'd say, 95% of software. So the file drop down is, you know, new file, open, save as, import, export, etc. Then we have the edit uh, drop down menu, which is around, you know, uh, exploding items, trimming items, joining them, stuff like that. Uh, and then from here on out, the, the drop down boxes are really broken into categories or topics within Rhino of commands within Rhino and then have them appropriately organized underneath. So um, curve has to do with anything that's 2D line based. So we can see here arc, circle, ellipse, um, parabola, offset, blend curve, stuff like that. We then have our surface objects. Um, sub D, solids, meshes. These are all, again, uh, commands that are relevant to that geometrical category. The dimension drop down, I would think of as the uh, annotate tab in AutoCAD. It really has to do with more with drafting, dimensioning, text, uh, call out, stuff like that. The transform drop down is all your typical um, transforming tools. So move, rotate, align, scale, etc. Tools is really for more of the in-depth scripting components. So we can see here Python scripting and Grasshopper. This is sort of a visual coding uh, platform that's used to execute complex commands. Analyze is really about the analytical component of Rhino understanding shapes and geometries, looking at stress points and heat maps um, across curvature. Render is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. It has to do with the rendering engine that's built into Rhino, the default one. But if we had a plugin, it would also be listed here. And then we have panels, which shows, you know, you see the tick boxes there show us which panels are currently open. So we have our layers and properties first and foremost, and we saw those on the right hand side of the screen. And then finally, the help drop down menu. The final way to execute a command is through the tab and ribbon, um, or otherwise known in, in Rhino as toolbars. So again, we can see that if I click on any of these tabs, the corresponding ribbon will update with icons relevant to the commands within that category. So C planes is uh, like a it's C plane is short for construction plane 
or it's otherwise known as a reference plane. And when I click on that, all these commands come up here, which I can then click on to execute. So even in the more simplistic term, if I go down to my drawing toolbar on the right hand side, and I just click on polyline, I click on that and it will then ask me to start my polyline. No different to if I was just to type in to the command bar polyline, same thing. After that, taking a closer look at the viewports, by default in Rhino viewports will be open starting with top, perspective, front and right. But we can maximize and minimize these viewports simply by clicking on the name. So in this instance, perspective, and then double clicking on that, that takes us to a full screen view. I can then minimize that image or minimize that window by double clicking on that again. And I can also change the perspective or I can change the preset view by clicking on this little arrow next to the name. So I could do that in any of these. So let's say in this instance, down here on the right, I want this to be a left hand side view. I can click on this little drop down box and change that to set view and change that to left as an example. I can also change the way that I'm viewing my model. So if we double click on the perspective view, I can click on the drop down box. And at the moment we're looking at this model in wireframe mode, but I could change that to say shaded mode, which then gives us those um, solid objects. Um, Next up, we have the windows and panels. So looking on the uh, right hand side of the screen, I've got my properties window, my layers window, rendering materials and my help. I also have something called named views docked at the bottom. This saves preset uh, perspective images within the model. Now you guys, when you first open this up, it's probably going to look much different to this, but it's very easy to customize um, to whatever style that you like. So. I'll go through each of these and how to use these windows in a different session later on. But really for now, just navigating through, um, it's very flexible in the way that you can add and remove panels. So again, if I go up to my panels uh, drop down menu, I can say, for instance, I don't want the help uh, panel. And when I untick that, you'll see that help appears here and it, it will then pull it up and I can remove it. So I can click on any of these icons so for instance, with help, I might just click and drag the icon out to the middle of the screen. And that panel or window is now free from docking on the side here. I can then close that up. Let's say for instance, I wanted to do that with my layers as well. So I drag my layers out and I click and now my layers are free from the docking on the right hand side of the screen. I could accidentally close my layers and want to know where they're gone and how do I bring them back. I simply go up to the panels, drop down list and then click on layers and it will appear again. I can then uh, clicking on where it says rhinoceros, I can click on that, drag it and you can see wherever I hover my mouse, it will dock it in that area. So I could dock it on the left hand side, right hand side, whatever I feel. I tend to use, I tend to do something like this where I'll have um, my layers docked next to my properties and then usually a small toolbar or a small panel down here for some other reason. You can easily resize the, um, the, the size of these panels just by using the grips. Um, or if you're tight for space, like in this instance, I'm using a small screen, so I'm tight for space. I can click on the name layers and then I could just drag that into this window and now it's docked with the rest of the panels. And then I can change the sequence of panels just by clicking and dragging them left and right. So now I have my properties first and my layers second. This applies to not just these panels, but any of the toolbars you see here. So even the command bar, you might've noticed it sits in a different position to yours. I can easily take that command bar and actually dock it at the bottom of the screen. I can dock it at the very bottom down here underneath my snaps or I could dock it just uh, below all of my toolbars that are listed up here. So it's very, it's a very flexible software. Um, the other thing we can do is we can add and remove uh, tabs and the corresponding ribbon, or we can add and remove toolbars. And the easiest way to do that is just by right clicking in this space and we can see show toolbar here. And these are all the toolbars that are possible within Rhino. Generally speaking, we're not gonna need more than the standard setup that, that's there by default when you open out of the box, but this gives you an idea of just how customizable uh, you can make Rhino relevant to your needs. Keeping in mind that Rhino is used 
for everything from manufacturing, jewelry design, product design to um, aviation, automotive and architecture. So it needs to be a very flexible software. And finally, if we look at the bottom of the screen, we've got our snaps and uh, some other items that we can click on and off. I'd call this really our toggle, our toggle toolbar because they're re uh, the only option is to either tick them on and off. And really we have our snaps down here. So similar to how snaps are utilized in AutoCAD, um, we then have project and disable. Uh, we'll go through each of these in greater detail later on. And then at the bottom, we also have grid snap, orthogonal, ortho, planar, O snaps, smart track, gumball, uh, record history and filter. Again, we'll go through each of these in greater detail and exactly what they do. By now, you would no doubt notice that my interface looks different to yours as Rhino comes out of the box when you first install and when you first download and install it. So let's take a quick look at graphics and colors and options and customization. And then we'll look at simple mouse control commands for navigation. So firstly, I'm just gonna type in anywhere on the screen, nothing is selected. I'm just gonna type in options and hit enter. I get my options window coming up and as the name implies, this is where we do all customization within Rhino. But I'm gonna focus particularly on the appearance tab and the little drop down icon, which then brings up the colors tab. So firstly, when I select an object, mine is a lime green, yours is probably a yellow, but you can see here, you can change it to any color you so wish. So in this instance, I have got mine selected as a lime green. I'll click okay. And you can see when I select an item, it comes up as that lime green selection. So it's very clear to me what I'm clicking on. Notice as well is that when I do select an item, in the corresponding viewport, those items are also highlighted. So this face or this um, surface here is selected in perspective, also in top view and also in the left view. It will also be in the front view as long as I scroll out and so I can see the entire model. The next thing you're gonna notice is the background color of my perspective window, which has got this pinkish white two-tone. The way that that's happening is because I'm in a shaded mode at the moment and the shaded mode has customized graphical qualities to it and you can apply these graphical qualities to any view or any view style for that matter. So in order to bring that up, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna type in display properties and I get this window that appears here. And in fact, I'm gonna dock this into my toolbars, or sorry, into my windows on the right hand side. So now I have this um, display properties associated here in my panels on the right. And at the moment I'm in display mode called shaded. My background is a two tone gradient with the top color as pink and the bottom color as white. If I change this style back to wireframe, at the moment, I can't change the background of wireframe. It just stays as this, this nominal gray. But if I choose another background, let's say like rendered mode, that makes everything like a you know a shaded object. I can actually change the color of this background too. So in this instance, I've got more of a sky background where the top is blue and the bottom is white, but I could click on this gradient and I could make this, you know, again, whatever color I wanted it to be. So a bit more of a purple. Um, and all I could choose up to a four color gradient as well. So I can continue to have different colors going through, through my viewport. The next item as well is docking uh, of windows and the way that these are set out. As I covered just previously, you can drag these, um, you can drag these panels or these toolbars wherever you wish to. Again, I tend to have my layers docked out here and then I dock them next to my properties and I'll drag this out. And that just allows me to have uh, good control or good visibility um, between, panel, uh, between my properties and my layers because these two are the two uh, panels or windows that I utilize the most. So moving on to navigation, I'm gonna minimize this. It's possible to have, firstly, it is possible to have different view styles in each of the viewports. So these are in wireframe mode. Well, the, this uh, perspective is in shaded mode. So going through the simple navigation commands to zoom in and zoom out, as you could guess, it is literally just the scroll, scroll wheel on your mouse. Um, same in the top view in the orthogonal or what I would call your CAD views, you know, like your, your orthogonal 
um, um, you know, top view, front view, left view, etc. Um, is the same thing. You'll notice as well, wherever I point, wherever my mouse pointer is, is where I'll zoom in. So let's say I, I'm pointing on this sphere at the moment. If I zoom in, it zooms in that direction. If I do that again now and zoom in on the uh, on the surface, just holding my, my cursor over that point and then hitting zoom will then trigger Rhino to zoom in in that um, denoted area. The same thing applies in the top view or the orthogonal or the CAD views. To orbit in the 3D view, all I have to do is just hold down my right mouse button and I orbit around the model. But holding down the right mouse button in the, uh, um, in the orthogonal or the um, orthographical views will simply pan, much like in CAD where you use the middle mouse button to pan, in Rhino you use the right mouse button. If I want to pan in my 3D space, I have to also hold down shift on the keyboard and then my right mouse button. And now you can see I'm panning around left, right, up and down. Zoom in, orbit around, and then pan by holding down shift. That's what it, it, you can't, you actually can't orbit around in these views. So holding down shift, anything like that's not gonna do anything because we just wanna be able to pan, zoom in and navigate. Next up, we'll look at selections. So to select an object, again, I can select an object in any of these views and it will select it in the corresponding view. So if I select the torus in the, in the top view, it selects it in the perspective. If I select a cube in the perspective, it selects it in the orthogonal views. If I want to select more than one object, I simply hold down shift on my keyboard and continue to click more objects. And if I want to remove an, uh, an item from my selection, I hold down control and click on the item that I want to remove from my selection. I can cancel the com I can cancel any command at any time or any selection simply by hitting escape. And I might hit escape a couple of times to make sure that I've deselected and then exited the command is just a good habit to get into. Sometimes, or what, what very commonly occurs is that you'll select an item and you wanna zoom in on it, um, but sometimes it's not as easy as having something like this with all of these model elements just out in the open, or you might be far away from it at that point in time. A really good method to zoom into the item that you've selected is to use the command zoom select. And the shortcut for that is just ZS, and then hit enter or spacebar. To execute a command, you can either hit enter or spacebar. Personally, I just I use spacebar. So when I do that, you'll see that I immediately zoom in on that object. The other thing you'll notice too, is that because that object is selected and I zoom selected it, it is now the center point of my orbit. So when I orbit around that object, that's the point of which I'm orbiting around. So let's say for instance, I want to orbit around this um, mesh object over here, with that object selected, it becomes very hard to inspect this object and orbit around it. But if I select this mesh object, go ZS spacebar, and then orbit, you'll see now that I'm perfectly orbiting around that object because it is the pivot point or the center point of my, uh, my rotation. The opposite is true as well. So if I am zoomed in on this area here, but I wanna see the whole model, I can easily just you know scroll out so I can see the whole model, but it is not always that easy, especially if we're working on a large complex building. So in reverse, rather than zoom selecting, we can use zoom extents. And as you could guess, the command for that is just ZE and then enter. And what that will do is it will show you everything within your model space within that viewport. Now I've been using the four viewports open at any given time. But personally, I tend to work in the one viewport, particularly the perspective viewport, until I have some sort of command or some sort of operation where I need to see the others. I'll then minimize it and then open up, say, my top view to start drafting or my right view or whatnot. So before we get started, let's take a quicker look or a closer look into our simple transform tools. So I'm gonna uh, maximize my viewport and let's go through some of these. So pretty simplistically, you know, uh, I go to a top view, I select an item, um, I can type in M for move and then it's much the same. I mean, it's exactly the same as AutoCAD where I find a point on the object that I wanna snap to. I click and then I move it in some direction and I can, you know, type in 
uh, I can type in a number, hit enter, click, and now that item has moved. But before we start going through the transformation uh, items in detail, let's take a quick look at our snaps. So <clears throat> currently I've got N, near, point, mid, I have not got center ticked, um, interp, uh, perpendicular, and that's basically it turned on. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter too much. Center, I keep off because I can get a little bit frustrating. And then tan and quad can also get a little bit frustrating. Um, but they do have their purposes. The important one I want to draw your attention to, though, is project and disable. So disable will exactly do that. So I tick that and they all turn off at once. It saves me needing to go through and tick each one. So that's the first one. And project. So I'm really quickly just going to draw up a box. And then what I'm going to do, so that's a box that is X, Y, Z high. I'm just going to quickly make that taller. Okay. And so what I'll do is I'm going to draw a line. Uh, so L for line, enter, click the point to start. So I'll start here and then I'll end over here. So that looks all good. I've drawn a line from this point to this point. However, however if I go into my perspective view, we can see that what's actually happened is I've drawn from the top of this box down to this point here because it's snapped to the top corner. This can get especially frustrating when you're moving objects and you're actually moving them from the wrong point or when you're drawing uh, curves and lines and you're drawing them on the wrong plane. So the way to, to get around that issue is to tick the box that says project. So essentially it's going to draw it straight onto the C plane, the construction plane, which in this case is you know the um, where all of these objects are sitting, not from the top of the box. So if I do that again and draw a line from this point to this point and then go to perspective, you'll see it's drawn up from the bottom of the box across to this drawn, these curves over here. So that's the first point. So when I'm working in an orthogonal view, whether it's top, front, left, right, whatnot, I make sure I've got project on. If I'm in 3D, I have a little bit more control. So then I can say, if I draw a line, I can say, all right, I know I'm picking this corner at the bottom of the box to this point. I know that I'm gonna be drawing in the correct plane. So those are snaps and uh, those are snaps and uh, project. The next one that I want to take a look at is uh, the gumball item. So when I select when I select one of these objects, you know, I, it highlights green because I've selected it. But that's basically it. However, click on this little toggle down here in the bottom of the center of the screen called gumball, and you get this thing that appears: the blue, red, and green arrow, and some like um, some arcs as well. So I'll use a rect. I'll just use a box as a um, example. So. What they are is you've got, the, the reason why the, the gumball is such a powerful tool is you have the ability, these arrows here, you have the ability to move the object in any direction simply by clicking and dragging. Now I'm gonna turn off grid snap so I don't get that choppy, that choppiness um, as I move my cursor. Um, I can move it in any of these directions just by clicking and dragging, but I can also just click once on that arrow and I can type in a number. So I might type in 50 and it's now moved 50 millimeters away or up 50 and I'll move upwards 50 millimeters as an example. So it gives me an ability to be precise in, in the direction change of that object. I then also have these dash lines here, the dash red and green line. And what they are is that's a scale tool. So I can just click and drag that. You can see I'm scaling it in the vertical or the X direction or I could scale it in the in the Y, uh, sorry, in the X direction, that was in the Z direction, sorry. But I can also hold down shift and that will allow me to scale it com um, equally, completely in each direction. So a uniform scale. The last one is uh, the arcs. So the arcs are the rotation tool. So if I have a rotation snap set on, which I currently do at um, 15 degree, 45 degree increments, it will allow me to snap the object. <laughs> But I can also click on that and then type in a number like 45 and it will rotate it for me. And again, I can keep doing that in each direction. So in the in the Z axis, this green arc, I could also click and then type in 45 and it will flick it in that direction as well. So there's a lot of power with the gumball tool and you'll find it just gets easier. Like when I'm in top view, it just might be easier to click on it and go, okay, I wanna move it 50 mil or actually I've moved it too far or move it 25 mil back the other way. It's a, it's a bit more precise. 
Now, of course, with project, um, with project selected, I can still click the item, type move and go from the center point or the end point. You know, all these snaps are common to you now from using AutoCAD and then just type in 50 and then hit enter and the item will move 50 mil in that direction. The other thing that the gumball allows us to do is to automatically copy objects. So with these arrows in particular, there's a real power in holding down alt and then clicking on one of these arrows. So I'm gonna copy this box in the Z direction. So I'm holding alt on the keyboard. I just click the arrow and that says minus 25, that's fine. I'll, I'm gonna make a copy 25 mil below this one. Hit enter and you'll see there is my new cube underneath the other one. So the gumball is uh, an extremely powerful tool and you should have that on at all times. I'm going to delete this and the method to delete any object in Rhino, as you could guess, you either type in delete or you can just hit delete on the, on the keyboard as well, the, the delete key. So some of the other commands we can utilize. So I'll go back to my top view. We can copy, um, as I said, we can copy in two ways, holding down Alt on the keyboard, clicking the red arrow, and I will just type in 25 to create a second version. I can also go Control C and then Control V and then drag that across because when I go Control V, it will paste it to the same place in space. So then there's two there. The other method of course is just to type in copy hit enter or spacebar, click where you wanna copy from and then where you wanna copy to. Move, we just went through in detail. Uh, rotate, again, I can use the arcs even in this top view. I can type in a degree like 33 degrees and it will rotate it. Or I can use my rotate command, hit spacebar. Where do I wanna start my rotation? I wanna start it from this corner. And then I can then click once more. And then I can either, at the moment it's snapping at 90 degree intervals. And that's because ortho is on the toggle. So again, much like AutoCAD, I'll untick that. And you'll see now I've like the ability to rotate in whichever direction I choose to. And I might go at now 23, 22 degrees and type and then hit enter. Okay. And the rest of the commands are much the same. So mirror, click, Click where I want to start my mirror, move my mouse down, down the axes, hit uh, hit the key, um, just uh, click my mouse and that, that operation is complete. Now all the transform tools are underneath the transform um, drop down menu at the top. You know, uh, move, copy, rotate, scale, shear, mirror, all of the rest of them. Um, it, it basically, all of the commands are exactly the same. All the transform commands are exactly the same as AutoCAD just you have to consider where you're clicking from and to because you are in a 3D space. So again, if you are working in a top view or a front view, make sure you have project clicked. Um, you don't need to have that clicked if you're in a perspective view because even here, if I copy this object, I can say, I'm gonna copy it from this bottom corner here up to the top of this corner here as an example. So it becomes much easier to understand where I'm selecting and what I'm snapping to. The fundamental geometric objects in Rhino are points, curves, surfaces, polysurfaces, extrusion objects, and polygon mass objects. We'll touch on each of these as appropriate throughout the assignment. Rhino at its core is a NURBS based software and NURBS stands for non-uniform rational B-splines, which is a mathematical model using B-splines that's commonly used in computer graphics for representing curves and surfaces. It offers great flexibility and precision for handling both analytical and modeled shapes. It's a type of curve, a, a curve modeling as, a, um, as opposed to um, classical mesh polygonal modeling or digital sculpturing. So taking a look at some of the basic 2D objects in Rhino in greater detail, we start with points, which points us uh, the most simple object that is possible within Rhino and is really just a visual representation of a XYZ coordinate in space. We then move on to a line, which we've covered already in um, software like AutoCAD, which is essentially two points. We, as when I select this, we can see point one, point two, and the connecting curve or line between them. Polylines are simply a, um, a nothing more than a continued sequence of lines um, that are welded together. And then we move on to more curved, uh, or to, basically onto curves or polylines that are curves. 
And when we look at curves, there's another notion that comes into play, which is called the, the curve degree. So when we look at a traditional polyline like this one just here, we can see that the corners are completely sharp. That has a curve degree of zero. Um, but when we think of curves in the real world, we think of continuous smooth curves. Um, and that is really down to the curve degree and its control. So there are three degrees of curves um, and they vary uh, in difference in terms of the amount of points and the weight of control that they have over the curve. There's a whole mathematical topic around this and, and its relationship to curves. However, that's outside the scope of this course. Rhino has a number of built-in 2D uh, curves and objects that we can start with, including uh, rectangles and squares, arcs, ellipses, circles, polygons, and the typical line and polyline commands. Surfaces in Rhino can best be thought of as a flexible sheet and they can represent planes, spheres, cylinders, or another a number of other complex geometries. Surfaces can be controlled via control points. And if I turn on the points in the surface, we can see how those points that we spoke about before, those control points are then moved into the 3D realm with the corresponding Z coordinate. So as I move this, the shape itself or the, the surface itself reacts to the movement of those control points. Surfaces can also be opened or closed. Um, for example, uh, this cylinder here is an open surface, um, whether the torus just here is a closed surface, where the top surface and the bottom surface meet around the circumference um, across the seam. Surfaces can also be trimmed and untrimmed. So using that same surface from before, we can project or uh, intersect it with, a, with another corresponding shape and then remove that uh, shape or area from the original surface. And we can tell if an object is trimmed or whether it was drawn as so simply by turning on the control points. We can see that even though that part of the object or that surface is gone, the, the, the control points still remain. You can also take a look at the, the U and the V ISO curves across the object and we can change its density as well. So uh, we have these lines across here that signify the U coordinate or the U direction of the surface and these ones across here which signify the V coordinate. And by clicking on the object and going to the properties pa panel, I can change the density of that surface, essentially um, creating uh, more detail or more, contro more control points across the surface. Poly surfaces are more than one surface that's essentially joined uh, together, um, much like a poly line. And poly surfaces that enclose a volume are called solids. So objects like a sphere or a cube um, these are called closed solid poly surfaces. It's important to note that in order for an enclosed poly surface or a solid to be deemed a solid, it must be watertight. Extrusion objects are essentially 2D objects that are pulled in one direction to turn it into a three-dimensional object. They can both be open extrusion, such as this jagged line, or a closed extrusion, such as the rectangle or the square that started this object. We then also have meshes. So as noted before, Rhino is mostly a NURBS-based software, but it does have basic mesh operations. And meshes are different to NURB surfaces. Um, NURB surfaces are a constant curve where the meshes are more jagged. And the best way to describe this is sort of like the difference between a pixel-based object and a vector-based object in that the resolution um, downgrades the closer that I zoom into this object. So we can see as I zoom into this object closer, these edges are appearing much more jagged, kind of like pixels. Whether a vector-based image, like a NURBS-based uh, piece of geometry, you can see the closer I zoom into the surface, it never loses its smooth curvature. So essentially for this assignment, you are to take the referenced uh, plans and images that are located on student web, navigate those and translate them into a 3D model 
inside of Rhino and then produce 3D renders and then bring them into Photoshop, put them on title blocks and uh, give them a touch up in terms of uh, Photoshop editing. So just running through this very quickly and then we'll look through the plans in details. You're given a, a floor plan, a site plan, elevations, and then some reference images. So this is um, a modular house construction and that's what we're working on is uh, this design. So essentially we are you're all tasked with the same building. Your interior fit out can be different. Where the kitchen's located has to be the same. The kitchen design has to be as is. Bedrooms have to be located in the same place. So do windows and doors, but you have free reign in terms of the materials you use, the facade type, uh, internal finishes and fixtures, and of course, like your furnitures as well. So from this point, what you'll do is you'll take this and then take that in, uh, so then you'll model it into Rhino. And so here's an example of the completed Rhino model. So we'll end up with layers for topography, um, all your furniture, lighting, um, interior finishes, windows, doors, etc. And then from there, you'll end up generating uh, raw rendered images out of Rhino. So here's the exterior shot. That's one interior shot. And that's another interior shot of the open living area. And that 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 is what you're assigned to do is to produce one external render and two internal renders and from that point you then put it into photoshop do some editing work to it uh, and with actually very minimal editing in photoshop compared to say the photoshop floor plan we've worked on but taking the same principles you'll end up producing something that looks like this on a title block so there is our exterior render there's the internal, very little done, just adding some window reflections and a person. And then our sectional uh, open living space render as well. Notice as well that the title block has all the relevant information, the task number, unit number, your student name and student number also on there. So that is the end result, something like that. Now you can choose um, a completely different angle for your render. That's not a problem. You can choose different rooms. I'd suggest that an open living room um, uh, render is appropriate, but whether you want to do an entranceway or a bedroom or something out the deck, um, that is completely up to you. It, you've got complete free reign there. So taking a closer look at the actual plans themselves, the best thing to do when modeling, especially in this instance where we have a set of plans that we're referencing, is to break this up and try and rationalize it and try and essentially work smarter, not harder. So because it is a modular design, the first, the very first thing we can pick up on is that there is a repeatable, there are repeatable um, or repetitive sorry, components. So we've got two bedrooms, an ensuite, a shower. That is like one module that's then copied and pasted. So immediately we can just worry about modeling one of these and then copying it across, utilizing maybe a group um, or a block. We'll, we'll work out which one works best. The next thing to do as well in this um, in these uh, living quarters or in the living, um, let's call it the bedroom wing, is the size of these windows. So we're not given any of the dimensions uh, for the, any of these elements, but the good thing is with one of the any of these softwares for that matter, is as long as we have one known dimension, we can essentially scale this drawing inside of Rhino and then just trace it. It's very easy to model because we're essentially tracing it. Now the principle is the same whether we're tracing an actual uh, a full-blown drawing or whether we're tracing a, a hand-drawn sketch. As long as we have one known dimension, we can scale it and then start modeling over the top of it. So that would be the next step is to rationalize the windows. And we can see, for instance, that window, that window, that one, that one, they're all the same size. Along the corridor, that one and that one are the same size. This means we only have to make one block or window block for these, one window block for these. Doors are the same. Essentially, all the doors will be 820 doors, all the internal ones, um, except for the external. But the external has a side light that we would model separately. Then moving into the lounge room space, we can see that essentially these thirds are even as well, or almost even, um, given taking into account that you have the overhang there. But our living spaces are not too dissimilar in terms of being modular in their setup. And in terms of architecture, they're actually quite open. Uh, so really it would just be a case of uh, ascertaining what the length is between here and here 
and then finding a, uh, a decent number to equalize to create our window panels or our big sliding doors. The same principle from this point to this point, they are all just sliding, either fixed uh, glass or sliding doors. We can see where those sliding doors are. We've got these points here that we can utilize too. So from this point to this point, this might be one glass pane. From this point to this point, it could be perhaps three. And then here, it looks like there's two sliding doors and then a fixed pane here, which just means essentially you're gonna divide this line and this line up by four. So it, there's no real right or wrong in how you can approach this, but this is generally how it starts. I try and find some language that we can continue with because essentially what that means is we can model one window for four windows. We can model another window for another two windows. We can model one door for essentially five or six doors. Um, and then same around here with the sliding glass and the fixed glass, we might be able to find a rational size that would accommodate uh, this this side, the northern face and the eastern face besides the sliding doors. Then the the um, the size of the joinery is something that we'll consider later on. That's modeled sort of separately. And then essentially anything that is uh, not fixed, uh, in other words, anything that is not there on day one when you moved in uh, is essentially a downloaded model. And we can find many, many you know, free sources online to download some really high quality models. And then we can either just place them as is or we can retexturize them. And so again, utilizing um, the rest of the drawings here, we've got uh, some elevations, which are pretty easy to work out. They help us get the idea of the design of our windows and, and door openings. The facade material is not a problem. You can choose whatever facade material that you desire. And again, the visual references here just sort of help explain how some of these other facades um, work and how some of the uh, how what the window details look like and what our roof overhang looks like you know that type of thing um, and then as for the landscape we'll model uh, a NURB surface for our landscape and use control points to push and pull our landscape and then really in the final design uh, or in our final render we don't need to model much you know, if anything of the landscape, because a lot of it is actually photoshopped in. It's actually a very quick way to do it. If we started modeling every tree um, in, sp in this space, especially for a model that's in schematic phase like this one, the model would A, become incredibly heavy and uh, become very slow to use, and B, would be at risk of you know file corruption and whatnot. So it's you're better off just doing something like what we're doing here. Um, and you'd be surprised at how quickly you can uh, rattle off a bunch of conceptual renders that will do more than enough to convey what your architectural idea is. So with this in mind, we'll then we'll then uh, take this into Rhino, scale the uh, image and start drawing out and essentially tracing over this floor plan using simple lines or in Rhino, all lines are called curves. Even if it is a dead straight line, even if it's a dead straight line, it's still called a curve in Rhino. So we use our curve tools and we'll draw these walls and all these doors. Um, well, actually not the doors, all the walls as if we're drawing an AutoCAD. And then what we'll do is we'll um, find a relevant size of the windows and doors and we'll essentially punch holes through the walls to create the openings, which we then go and make the blocks to then fit within it. It actually replicates a lot um, of the real world construction method in terms of the sequence that we build a model like this. It's very similar to the sequence that you would actually construct this building in real life. If it wasn't um, uh, prefabricated, if we were building this on a, on a new construction site from scratch. So with a preliminary plan in place, looking at the PDFs of how we're going to attack this model, let's uh, open up Rhino and actually get started. So with Rhino open, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the command called picture. So just type picture, hit enter, and it's gonna open up your browser. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna find my reference floor plan that's downloaded from student web and then click open. And when that happens, I'm gonna get um, a prompt to select where the first corner of this image is gonna be. So I'll just select anywhere around here and then uh, I click once and then I move my mouse to drag the size of the picture. So obviously the bigger I drag, you know, the more I drag it, the bigger it gets. And I'll just click anywhere. I don't really mind at this point. So let's maximize our top view. And the first thing we wanna do is um, make sure that we have this image at the correct size. So 
we have a reference dimension here, which is great, 11.88 um, meters. Now, if we didn't have a dimension, that doesn't matter. We could use anything as a reference. Like we know that an internal door is probably 820 wide. Exterior door is probably 920 or 1020. Um, we know that this island bench could be anywhere between 900 and 1100 wide, perhaps. Um, so there is always multiple ways that you can find scale. And this is important for drawings, um, like say sketch drawings, like when you do a design for a, for a project and you don't have a scale on there, you just, you've just been sketching away and you, you know, you want to bring that in here and actually model it up. Then you could utilize some known reference. Um, but if a dimension is given to you, then all the better. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use my line tool. So L for line spacebar or enter to execute the command. I'm going to zoom right in on this dimension. And obviously it's a pixelated image. It's just a JPEG. So it's going to be pixelated, but I'm just going to eyeball the center of what I think is the center. And I click once and then just drag my hand across. Keeping in mind, I have ortho, ortho snaps on. So that way it automatically will go in 90 degree directions. So I'll just hover my mouse over here and I'm going to type in 11880 and then enter. And then you can see here's where that point is. That's where it's going to end, but it's not going to actually com com complete the, the dimension or the size of that line until I click. So when I click now that line just there that I've selected, that is 11.88 meters long. So what we have to do now is scale this drawing to be bigger. And if it was smaller, it's the exact same process. So if the drawing was already bigger and I had to drag it down, the process is the same either way. So to scale, I'm going to select the image. I'm going to type in scale and then hit enter. And I'm going to click the start of that line that we drew because we know that's the start of the dimension. And then I'm going to come over to here and I'm going to find the end point of that dimension. And again, I'm just going to eyeball it. So it's going to be somewhere around here. And then I'm going to click again. And now you'll notice that as I move my hand left and right, I'm either growing or shrinking the drawing. So if the line was smaller, I would come down here until it snaps to the end of that line. Because the line is actually bigger than the drawing, I just have to move my hand over till I find the end point. Which is, there it is there. And then I just click once more click a third time and that ends the command. And so what that means now is that line that I drew that's 11.88 meters long, this drawing is also, or that section of the dimension is also that is that length. So now we know that the drawing is in fact in scale. So next up, um, let's create some um, layers and then some reference planes. So the layers uh, window or the layers panel in Rhino is, you know, it's very similar to AutoCAD where you've got, you know, create, uh, looking at some of the commands, you have create a new layer, you have create a sub layer, um, delete a layer, move a layer up or down, move a layer out of being a sub layer and back to a priority layer. You can filter layers um, and then you can do a few other things with them, which is almost never used. To activate a layer, you just double click on it. So if I want to activate layer three, I double click on it, it becomes bold. And there's a little there's a little tick, which then notifies me I'm on that layer. Also at the bottom of Rhino, you'll see down here, it will tell me the layer that I'm currently on, which is layer three. So if I double click back to the default layer, you can see that's updated to say default down the bottom. If I wanna update or change the name of a layer, all I have to do is just double click on the name. So instead of layer one, let's call this one perhaps, uh, let's call this background image and hit enter. And so what you can do then is apply lines and objects to layers and you can do it after the fact too. So this, this drawing at the moment is on the default layer. And we know that because again, very similar to AutoCAD, if I click on an object, any object whatsoever in the properties window, it will tell me what layer it's on. So in this case, it's on the default layer. So I can change that by either clicking on this drop down box and changing it here. So I could just click on background layer and now it's updated to that layer or the other way to do it. And this is the way that I prefer to, to change objects on layers is I'll click on the object and then I'll right click on the layer that I want to change it to and then say change object layer. And now that is updated. So if I double click on the default layer, I can then turn off my background layer and that's now gone. 
Okay, so the light bulb obviously turns it on and off. And the other tool that I like to use is this little padlock here that locks it. So this way I can't accidentally select it and drag it anywhere. I can't move it. Okay, the layer underneath of that is currently called layer two. Let's double click on that and let's change this to reference planes and enter. And I'm going to change the color of those lines to like a, a, a magenta or a pink. Okay. Like so. Okay. And then uh, layer three, let's change this to walls. Okay. So the reason why these are all capitals is because these are priority layers or the priority one layers. So underneath the walls layer, I'm actually going to create two more layers before we get started. And to do that, I'm going to create a sub layer. So I'm going to create um, just here. So I've clicked on walls. I'm going to create a sub layer. So now you'll see there's like a drop down list. And this one is going to be called curves because this will be all of the line work or think about like all the 2D CAD lines. They'll go on that layer. And then I'm going to make another sub layer. And because I'm already in a sub layer, I don't have to click create new sub layer because that will do this. We'll create another sub layer again. What I'm going to do is just create a new layer and this one will be called solids. Okay. Now that means that we can separate the two objects at any given time, but it will be under the walls layer, which I can then minimize. And you can see that's why it's in caps. So it's very easy to see curves and solids. Almost every layer is going to be set up like this. So we're going to have one. If we make another one, say um, layer four, let's double click and let's call this windows and then again a sub layer for curves and then another layer for solids and then i'll minimize that and this will become more apparent as time goes on the importance of being able to separate curves and solids from each other so with the reference planes layer i'm going to activate that so i'm going to double click on that and now you'll see whatever i draw on that layer it will reflect that color and the reason why we've done this is, is it's actually a lot like um, AutoCAD. So I'm going to start with just a line. I'm going to zoom into this corner here. I'm going to ignore this little nibby area and just draw a line straight down. So I'm just going to start from here and just move my mouse up. And then I'm going to click on that line. And I'm using the um, gumball. I'm just going to drag this down. Okay. So now we can start offsetting these lines and creating some guidelines for us to use. And this is a lot like what we did in the photo, in the AutoCAD assignment. So if I add up these numbers down here, we get like a total of 33.74 meters. That's the length of this building. But because this is a design model, I'm gonna sort of rationalize this a little bit just to make the maths a little bit easier for us. So I'm gonna round it up to 34 meters. That's the width of this building. So I'm going to offset these by clicking on this line, typing in offset, type in the dimension. So 34,000 and enter, and then just move my mouse across. Now this is going to become more common as well. You're going to see discrepancy between what I type and what we model and what the drawing is. Because remember this drawing is not perfectly the scale. We eyeballed it as best as we could. And that's fine. If we want to bring in a, a CAD, a, a DWG file, we could do that and we could just pick the line straight away. But when we're just using a JPEG, there's always going to be discrepancies and that's okay. All right, so I'm going to draw another line from this point here and I'm just going to draw this right across like so. And again, click on this and drag it across. And let's use this as well. So again, 495 is the width of this building. I mean, let's just, you know, for argument's sake, let's just round that up to five meters. Okay, so that's now done. And then what's the width here? So I'm just gonna use a line tool. And I'm just gonna go from six, nine. So let's just round that up to seven meters wide. So I'll click on this offset 7,000. Yep. Cool. 
And then this distance here is a little bit interesting because you've got the glass wall here, but then you have the roof overhang here. So again, we'll just clean this up for argument's sake. So that's a five meter gap and you can see this is modular, right? So that's four, that's 495 or in our case, we've rounded up to five. So it stands to reason that that would be five, that would be five. So in other words, from here backwards would be a 15 meter offset. So 15,000, thousand because we're working in millimeters up and that looks good. And I might even just go again down 5,000 as well to keep those, those modular sizes. All right, excellent. Now let's clean up this area too. So these two rooms, these two bedrooms are the same module, just repeated twice. So, and we know that our building ends over here. So let's just clean this up as well and see if we can get a nice round number because currently those two values are slightly different. You've got like, um, you've got the first module on the left, which is um, 10810 plus 11050. So it gives us 21860. So I reckon let's just round it up to 22 to make it easier for ourselves. So I'm gonna take this line here and then offset this back 22 meters. So offset 22,000. There we go. Okay, so we know that 11 meters will be straight down through the center. So I'll offset this back the other way, 11 meters. Okay, that looks good. So if I remove the background image, we've just got like a grid of lines here, but it is a good start. It is a good start to help us understand how we're gonna model this. So really the, the, the method to start this is to firstly scale your drawing, then put in your reference planes and also rationalize your dimensions. So we've now rationalized our wall sizes. And then once we draw our walls, we'll then rationalize our window sizes or our openings. So we'll rationalize our windows and our doors. So in terms of drawing the walls, because we can start drawing our walls now, we have to consider that you've got external walls and internal walls. And the external walls are gonna sit higher than the internal walls will. So we can break this up as well. So. We're gonna start from this point up here and work our way around, sort of like in this L shape. And we're gonna loop around, come around to here and then come down and then end it there because these internal walls we'll do separately. Just before we do that, we do have this fireplace here, which what's the nominal width? Probably 600. I reckon we'll come out 600 there. So that's okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to my walls layer and double click on the curves layer and by the way, I'm gonna make sure I'll give these the same color as the parent layer. Okay. And I'm just gonna use a polyline tool. So exactly the same as AutoCAD polyline and then click away. So I'll start in this area, come down to here. Okay. And then I'm gonna finish somewhere around here. I don't really mind at this point. And then enter or spacebar to finish the command. So now if I get rid of my background image, you can see how those lines are looking. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna select those lines. Now, if I click on any of these, I'm gonna get the selection menu. And the reason why you get that is because you've got two objects that are layering over the top of each other. So it just asks, Rhino asks you first, which one you want. In this case, I want the blue curve. I'm gonna offset this uh, 200, 250 mil for an external wall and then move my mouse inwards. It's gonna be offset it inwards and then click. So then that's my external wall taken care of. Yep, cool. All right, and the reason why I've done that is because I want to have a thousand between this place and this line here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw anywhere from here and just draw, or maybe, yeah, a thousand, yep. Like so, and then I'm gonna take a line and draw across, that looks good. And then I want to cap this off here. So uh, before I do that, I wanna cap this off here as well. So I'll go like that. So what I'll do now is I'll turn off my reference planes and then I'm just gonna use the trim command. So trim, select everything, 
and then just trim away. Perfect. I'm going to turn on my background image and around here where the fireplace is, I'm just going to quickly draw another polyline and I'm just eyeballing this. I'm going to go out 600. So I just type in 600, come down say 4.2 meters. Well, actually let's round that up 4.5 and then back across. Oops. Okay, excellent. I'll turn off my background image and then I'm going to trim this as well. Perfect. All right. Now, the last step before we go and extrude this into a three dimensional object is to join these up because at the moment, if I click on any of these curves and reminder, remember that in Rhino, everything is a curve. Even if it's a straight line, it's still called a curve. So if I click on any of these curves in the properties window, it tells me that the type is an open curve and we need to make sure before we extrude everything or anything for that matter, it has to be a closed curve. So I'm gonna select everything here and the selection window in Rhino is again, exactly the same as AutoCAD from uh, right to left. Anything that touches the selection box is selected from left to right. Anything that's wholly within the selection box is selected. So I'm just gonna go like this, select everything here, and then I'm gonna type in join into the command bar and then enter. And now that that's complete, when I click here, no matter where I click, it's gonna select the entire polyline. And you'll see here, the type is now a closed curve, which means it will extrude really cleanly. So I'm gonna turn back on my reference planes and my background image. Okay, and we're gonna to go to a perspective view. So double click out of here, double click into the perspective view, zoom out. I'm gonna click on those lines, those external lines. I'm gonna use the command extrude curve, enter, making sure that my project is not switched on, which it's not, and move my mouse up and I'm just gonna type in, um, let's say three and a half thousand. So 3.5 meters high. We can always change this later on. So if it looks something like this, that means that the model's in wireframe. So I could go up to my perspective view and change that to shaded. And now I see a solid object. Okay, so that's how we complete that and turn that into a three dimensional object. I have to as well, because I extruded those curves um, on the same layer, these are on the curves layer, these solids. So I need to make sure that I right click on where it says solids and say change object layer. And a good way to know whether your lines or your objects are actually on there is turn it off. So I'll turn off the solids layer and that should disappear. And the line should still be there. The curve should still be there. If it's not, I know I haven't got it on the right, um, on the right layer. So I'll turn that back on, all good. Okay, and now let's uh, let's go through and attack the bedroom area. Now, before we start drawing in here, I'm going to turn on project and the reason for that is so we don't accidentally snap to the top of the walls. Otherwise, we'll end up with diagonal lines. We want to make sure that we're drawing on top of this drawing here, on top of the floor plan. So I've got project turned on down here and I'm still on my curves layer and I know that because I've got the green tick. And I know that this is the center point of these two modules. So we're gonna draft this as best as we can, but it is going to look different to what's here. So I'm gonna draw a line from this point across to here. And then I know that wherever the midpoint is here, I'm gonna draw upwards and that's where my ensuite is gonna be. So my ensuite, I'm gonna start using my offset tools I'm gonna go back to my reference planes. And in fact, I might change these lines just quickly to reference plane. So I'll right click on it and say change object layer and you'll see now they're pink or magenta. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna scale out those planes because it'd be good to know the width, have that corridor um, offset there. All right, so it looks good. And then on the reference planes layer, I'm gonna offset again, say, what would it be? Maybe 800 either side. 
and then another 100 because we'll make our internal walls 100 just for argument's sake. Yep. And then going across the other way, we need to offset this line 100 upwards because that gives us the thickness of our bedroom walls. And then you want to make sure you've got a gap of probably at least uh, 920 or 950. So let's go, um, nine, or let's say 900 just to, just to round it out. So take this line, offset 900 up and then offset this line, 100. Okay, so it looks like a bit of a mess at the moment, but if you could imagine, if I turn off my background, you've got one bedroom door here, one bedroom door here, the ensuite is in this zone here, and the door would be here, and then we're gonna have a little nib on each side where the desk and the wardrobe goes on either side. Once we sort of draw that up and model it, we can just flip it over to the other module. So I'll turn that back on. And what I'll do as well is I'll take this line here and I'll offset it, say 700 or maybe 650 that way. And then this one 650 the other way because that's the depth of the desk and the cupboard on both sides. All right. Now this line in the middle here, because that this line here represents the center line of this wall and that we know that wall is going to be 250 thick because it's where the two modules join. I'm going to offset one, 125 this way and then leave it like so because we'll draw half of the wall here. Then when we flip it, the other half of the wall will get, uh, get drawn and modeled on the other side. So now with all these um, guides drawn, I'm going to go back to my curves layer, double click on that and now go to the polyline tool and let's just start tracing away. Okay, so I'm going to go I'm going to start from this corner here, draw down, come across. Oh, actually, there is one more thing I didn't do. Big mistake. I need to make sure I leave an opening for us to actually get through from the hallway into here. That's cool. So what I'll do is we need a little nib because you see here's the door, but there's like a little nib just before that. So what I'll do is let's go from here and maybe offset that 300 this way, offset that 300 that way, and that's fine. Okay, so let's go again, polyline. And I'll start from this corner, making sure I draw down first and then come across. And here's that new line here. Just tracing over the reference lines. All right, so when I get to the external wall, I'm not gonna end it. I'm gonna come across to the left, to there, and then draw it down again. And I need to, I need to do that because I need to make sure that all of these walls are closed curves. I can't have any of these lines open. All right, and we're almost done. Back to the start, there we go. All right, so it looks like a ripe old mess right now, but watch what happens. So what I'll do is first, I'll get rid of the background image, that's one. Then you see all the reference planes there in pink, that's two, I'll get rid of that. And now with three, I can get rid of these two lines as well. We then have our walls. So our opening to the two doors into the bedroom, ensuite, or sorry, bathroom here, the nib here, so you got a wardrobe here and a study desk here. And then these are closed lines or closed curves and we can see that because I've actually traced, I've gone up to the external walls and then cut back across and then come down. So it's one continuous line, which then means I can take this and I can use the mirror tool. Again, exactly the same process as CAD. And I'll flip it from this point here back the other way. And I now have the two modules which perfectly fit within this zone. So the last thing to do is to go back to my perspective view. I'll click on those two, holding down shift and go extrude curve. And this time 
I'm gonna I'm gonna move my mouse up and I'm gonna offset this or drag it up 2.7 meters and then hit enter. All right, so there we are. There's our there's our rooms. All right, and again, and in fact, here's a good tip for you as well to make sure that your curves and your solids are not on the same layer. Why not change your curves to another color? So let's be really exaggerating here and change it to say red. So very clearly we can see that these solids here are not on the solids layer. They're currently on the curves layer. So I'm gonna select those two and right click on solids and say change object layer. So now we know they are on the solids layer. And if I, hover, if I orbit underneath, we can see that the red lines are still there and we can turn those curves off at a later stage. Note though that you can't turn off the layer that you're currently on. That's why the tick is there and I have, there's no light bulb or anything. So I can't turn off what's currently there. I'm gonna delete this scale guide as well we used earlier. All right, so I'll turn back on the background image and the reference planes. All right. And so your task will be to replicate this. So you'll be to, you're going to draw these walls, external and internal. And then you're also going to draw, these are the only other internal walls. So we've got the kitchen here. You've got the kitchen wall, there's like two nibs on either side where the bench is, the workbench. And then you've got a uh, laundry nook back here, along with a toilet. These internal walls are only 100 mil wide and they're only 2.7 high. So I'll let you guys go through that. But you'll see with the grid lines or with these reference planes, you'll have to rationalize this. You know, so you know that this line here, should this, this gap between here and here should be at least a thousand. So you want to offset that a thousand at least. So that gives you where this wall starts and ends. And then same the other way, you know that a, a cupboard is typically say 650 deep and you're gonna want at least a thousand between those cupboards and your fridge and all the rest of it and this wall here. That then gives you the result of how wide your, um, your kitchen is gonna be. So with that now done, I'm gonna leave that to you guys to work on. Let's take a look at the windows quickly and rationalize the size of those. And this is a great reason why the solids are on a different layer because I'm gonna turn off the solids now so we can actually see the windows underneath. Now let's go through here and we don't need to know exactly where these are placed yet. Uh, we just wanna know a rough width that we can utilize. So if I just take a line and hover my mouse over you know, anywhere around these windows and just draw from one end to the other, I can see down the bottom, down next to um, where our layer is, you'll see there's, a, there's a, a dimension that comes up. That's a live dimension. So I can either type in a number and you'll see if I type in a number, say like 1500, that then shows at the bottom of the screen. Or if I cancel that, just wherever my mouse goes, it live reports to me what that width is. So if I hover my mouse over this end of the window, the windows are around 1470 wide, but let's round that up to 1500. So we know that the four bedroom windows are all the same width. So let's call them uh, 1400. Um, and then in terms of height, we'll make them full height. So there'll be 2.7, or actually you'd, you'd definitely make them um, slightly less. So maybe 2,400 high. So 1,500 by 2,400 high. And then we need to place them um, relative. So again, we wanna make sure that these two are placed correctly and then we just mirror them to the other side. So with um, the curves layer, so I'm still on the walls layer. What I'm going to do now is go to my windows layer and go to my curves and again, Let's change these colors to be slightly different to each other. So I might use orange for the curves and I'll make the actual solids green. All right, so I'll double click on curves and now I'm off my walls layer. And I'm just gonna quickly just draw a box. So polyline, and I'm gonna draw a box that is 2.4 meters long and that is 1500 wide. And then I'm just gonna finish that off and that's it. And then what I'm gonna do is gonna to go to my 3D view, click on my curves and go um, ZS, zoom select. So I can then orbit around that and then go extrude curve. And I'm gonna extrude that up to, it doesn't really matter. I might extrude it up maybe 1500. That's all I need. So. What we're going to do is we're going to use this, this stencil to actually punch a hole inside of the walls and then subtract this object from the walls. That is called a Boolean difference. 
It's a very uh, typical command that we utilize in all 3D modeling software. So what I'm gonna do is I need to tilt turn this up. So good thing I have the gumball turned on. And if you don't have this gumball turned on, make sure that it's ticked at the bottom of your screen that it's highlighted. So with that, um, with that selected, I'm gonna click on this red arc and type in 90. So now that that's um, sitting upright, and then I'm just going to use my move tool. I'm gonna to snap, I'm gonna turn off project. I'm gonna to snap to the bottom of this and then snap up to here. So this is now sitting on the ground level. Okay. All right. I'm also gonna click on this and, no, I'll leave that as is actually, it's fine. All right, so I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna go back to my top view and now with this like this, we can just drag this around, you know, wherever we fit, wherever we feel. We'll leave these curves here because we're gonna utilize those a little bit later. So with this in mind now, I'm going to turn back on my solids and I am going to turn on project and I'm also going to turn on wireframe. So I can see my walls, but I can see through them. So I'm gonna take my, and the reason why I got project on is because I don't want this box snapping to the top of walls or to the bottom of walls. I just want it to sit exactly where it is, but relevant to the wall. So I'm gonna use the move tool. I'm gonna to take this corner and I'm gonna punch it up against this nib here. So we know that if I turn off the background image, we know that the desk is sitting here. So we don't want the, we don't want the window right next to the desk. So what I might do is I might move this out to somewhere here. And I can actually mirror that. So I can use mirror, pick the center point of the two rooms and go like so. And then I can take this object and this object, I'm just gonna drag them in. So they're halfway in the building, halfway out the building. Okay, and what that looks like if I go to 3D, it looks like this. So you can see they're just half in, half out. All right. And then I'm gonna take these two and then mirror those two to the center line of the two modules. And now we've got all four windows. So the last thing we need to do is we actually need to drag these walls to be below ground level because we don't wanna punch through the base of this. It's not a door, it's a window. So this surface that we've been working on or what we would call the seaplane is actually our ground level, our finished ground level that you actually be walking on. But the floor or the or like the natural ground line would be lower than this. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna take this box or these external walls, okay? And I'm gonna use a command called scale 1D. So you can see that comes up there, scale 1D. So I'm gonna click that. And what I'm going to do, turn off project, unclick that. I'm gonna to click the top of the, of the walls and then click the bottom of the wall. And you're gonna see at the bottom of the screen down here, it says 3.5 meters. So I'm gonna click a second time. And then the third time, I can either type in a number or I can click to end the command. So you see I'm dragging the walls now downwards. So because this is on a slope, I'm actually gonna drag this down a whole meter. So I'm gonna type in 4.5 meters and then hit enter. So what that means now is these pink lines here, that denotes where your finished floor level is. And then this here denotes where this has been finished. Like it will actually go into the, into the land when we're done with this, but that's a good start. Okay, so last part of this command is we're gonna use Boolean difference. So I'm gonna type in Boolean, and then there's a few, there's Boolean two objects, Boolean insertion, Boolean split, Boolean union, and then Boolean difference. So I'm gonna use Boolean difference and hit enter. And it's gonna ask us, what do, you, what do you want to subtract from? And we wanna subtract from our external walls. So you click on that object. And then it says at the top here, press enter to continue. So you do that and that says, what would you like to subtract with? And what we wanna subtract with are these four boxes. So just click them, one, two, three, and four. Okay, and then you'll see here, it will say um, with that, delete input equals yes. So with that, it means it's going to delete these orange boxes once it does that. If you click that and say no, those boxes will stay there in place even though there's a hole punched in the blue wall. Generally speaking, I say yes because I don't want these after we're done anyway. So once that's done, I hit enter one more time and now we're done.
And so we have these four openings here, which are in identical places to the size that we want to those windows that we drew here. And then during our next class, we'll actually start to build these windows as a block and um, insert them into the wall. The process is the same with doors. The doors will be, in our case, they'll probably be uh, 2.4 high or 2.3 to 2300 high. Um, and then you can, you can place them into place uh, at an 820 wide. So the process is the same. You would just draw that up and then shove them in the walls and then Boolean difference them. So your task for before the next class, in total, your task for the next class is to model all your internal and external walls, which really we've done all of them except for this laundry um, kitchen area here because these are glass walls. So don't do those yet. We'll do those next week. Um, and then to Boolean difference your windows and your door openings where appropriate. So that will include your front door here. And also if I go back to our reference drawings just here, you'll see that at the front of the property, so that's the hallway there, you've got two skinny windows just here and you've got the front door here as well. So what we just went through with these four windows here, or if we look at the front, these windows here is what we just Boolean differenced. That's what we started with.